Welcome. Yeah, here we go. Let's do this. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to the Rough Fish Registry. We, uh, sitting here at the Oneida factory in Springfield, Missouri. Got a man that needs no introduction. J JP Morris, how's it going? Great. Thank you guys for having me on. Excited to talk about a little bow fishing, maybe some bows and all kinds of stuff. Oh, we're excited. We, uh, you know, we've been talking about doing this, texting back and forth for a couple weeks and finally nailed it down. So we're, uh, just ready to jump in. Yeah, let's do it. So when did you start bow fishing? So I got into bow fishing. I was probably 14 or 15 the first time I ever, you know, shot a fish with a bow. And uh, I had an, an old compound set up with a retriever on it and, uh, Buff, buffalo would spawn at our hunting camp around turkey season and I'd walk the banks and shoot a few fish but when I was about 17 years old I had a buddy from Oklahoma and he said you got to come out bow fishing with me he said this is real bow fishing so we went out for two nights on Grand Lake and that lake is loaded with fish tons of buffalo tons of gar a bunch of little commons and uh we filled the boat up. I had so much fun. Literally got back, and the next day I was calling the guys from Tracker, being like, hey, can you help me build a bow fishing boat? So I've had the bug ever since. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when you called Tracker, was it was was their mind just blown when you were trying to explain to them what you wanted and what, what was needed in a bow fishing boat? You know, the guys there are always excited uh, when we come to them with the project outside the, the normal because, you know, they work on fishing boats. They work on a lot of production boats, and... Our boat plant in Lebanon, uh, you know, we employ some really talented people, and we're building a lot of boats now. Uh, so when we come to them with a bow fishing boat project, it's always something new for them to work on. They're pretty excited. So the first one I came to them, it was a really simple setup, just a aluminum deck with some halogen shop lights and a 3,000-watt generator in the back, and they got me dialed in pretty quick. And, man, I'll tell you what, the freedom you got when you're 17 years old and you got your own <laughs> boat, you can go out at night all you want, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get hooked on. Oh, I can't imagine. Being, being 17, being able to roll out to the lake whenever you want. I probably wouldn't have graduated college. Or maybe even I wouldn't school. have graduated high school. <laughs> I mean, those 8 o'clock classes would have come pretty early. Little, uh, not, not much uh, room for, you know, self-improvement when you're out there every night. Just, oh, I can't imagine. So you went to high school in Springfield, and then you went to college in Mississippi, is that right? Yeah, so uh, from Springfield, Missouri here at... I uh, went to a high school here in town, and when I graduated, I actually went to uh, Ole Miss in Oxford, Mississippi. And uh, it was actually down there, I got to be friends with a buddy of mine named Jody Acosta, uh, who's uh, now helping with the BAA. And uh, I actually shot my first bow fishing tournament with Jody. He had an Air Ranger, actually Jeff Niebald bought his first airboat from okay. Jody. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we loaded up, and we went down to... Uh, Lafitte, Louisiana, and shot in the World Championships. So that was my first bow fishing tournament I ever entered. Went in, in uh, style with the World Championships. We didn't do great. I think we finished like 7th or 8th in the Big 20. But uh, it was a great experience. I met some really nice guys. I remember meeting Hoopty was down yeah. there. <laughs> and I mean, some characters. And, uh, you know, Yader and Butch and just a bunch of the guys that were kind of the, the you know, the old guard at all these bow fishing tournaments you always saw. So... Uh, really helped get me in the world of bow fishing. Actually, my friend Jody uh, actually introduced introduced me to Chuck and John, who we filmed the habit. With. I was gonna say, is that where you met him? Was down there at the first, the world's your first tournament? I actually didn't meet them then, but it was after they had started Iron Man bow fishing. It was their first year filming for Iron Man. Jody invited me. They were shooting silver carp down in Mississippi, okay. and so I brought two brand new twenty foot tracker aluminum boats, just regular boats, no decks or anything. And we were shooting those jumping carp, and we had an absolute ball. We hit it off from the very beginning, and we flat out destroyed two brand new boats in two days of shooting <laughs> jumping carp. I mean, I guess it's just product testing. I mean, you just got to call it chalked up to product testing for go. sure. Well, definitely. You know, that's the thing that over the years is, um, you know, I've been very lucky. I get to go out and play hooky a good bit and go hunt and fish, but, you know, it's part of the job, too. You got to be interfacing customers all the time and, and double-checking your products and, that's what's been really fun with Oneida for me is, uh, you know, I've owned an Oneida for like 12 years and I finally got this opportunity. I've always loved archery. And when the opportunity came up to buy Oneida, I was so excited because I'm like, man, I get to make my kind of passion, you know, right. work or at least part of it. And so uh, it's it's been a lot of fun, a learning process and really excited as it gives me more of an excuse to go play hooky and go shoot fish. That's awesome. So... 
So you go to Nida. This is going on three years now. This will be. This is our second second season. Second so. season, and uh, you've made some changes to the bows. Uh, Definitely. Uh, you know, we started out, and I bought an Osprey, like I said, twelve years ago, and there's been a few changes along the way just to improve the bow. But I mean, the design is perfect for bow fishermen, and I think that's why when you go to a lot of these tournaments, you know, you see guys shooting ospreys, and it's the reasons because these guys are spending a lot of money to go compete in tournaments and they're mm -hmm. going to shoot yeah. the best bow that they can afford the best bow and in that case the best bow they can get period mm -hmm. and so it makes it fun you know and easy when you've got what's known as like one of the top bow fishing bows out there if not the top bow when you're selling that it makes it really fun because you're not trying to pedal a product that's not great i mean you're really pushing the proven product that yeah it's been around and you know small changes here and there to make it better but the first thing, you know, when I bought the company that we had an issue with uh, were the limb pockets. Uh, they had plastic limb pockets, and, I mean, they used double side tape to hold it down. And I know places like Louisiana, you'd go, and it'd be hot, and your limbs would be popping out if you were trying to shoot small fish and shooting low poundage. But first thing we did was do machined aluminum limb pockets, and that really cured that issue. And uh, this year, we've got a new bow I'm really excited about called the Phoenix. Mm. And uh, it's a... New take on a very popular bow, which is the Black Eagle 2. And we basically took this proven design, built it around a new riser, and then we brought in a lot of technology that's common on, you know, today's compound bows and brought it to the lever bow world or, or to Oneida. And uh, it's a sweet shooting bow. I've been shooting it fishing uh, all this spring, and uh, I was able to deer hunt with it some last fall, and I'm getting ready to go chase some turkeys. So I'm pretty excited about it. You got, uh, already got a turkey down, right? Yeah, actually, I got to take, a, I got two birds in Florida. I only had one day to hunt. Um, hunted with a good friend of mine named uh, Rusty Sellers, who started True Timber. Yeah. And uh, we actually doubled on our first setup of the morning, and then we were able to actually sneak in and tail fan another gobbler right up close, about 20 yards, and, and got him. So I'd never seen the tail fan done, and I, I'd seen it done on hunting shows, but never in person, and I saw it done last year. I think that's the only way I'm going to hunt anymore. It's I mean, so much fun. Yeah, them things. It's almost self defense when they come in. I mean, you got to shoot them things because they're, they're it's coming running. at you. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're in trouble. Well, there's some situations, you know, where those turkeys just don't want to come. I mean, they either got hens or can just content out in the middle until they see something that really convinces them they're not going to break that, you know, 75, 80 yard barrier. Yeah. I remember two years ago here in our Missouri season, you know, we can only hunt until one in the afternoon. And uh, I got up to a field that was, it was 12 45. So I've got 15 minutes left in the whole season. It's the last day. Bird up there about 250 yards, and I just said, you know what? I'm just going to go crawl right to him. And I made it about 20 yards and looked, and he was looking at me. And I got down, kept crawling, and made it about another 20 yards, and I looked up, and he was about 30 yards just running right at me as fast as he could run. <laughs> so, you know, in those situations, last-ditch effort, you just got to go for it. That's awesome. We uh... So the Phoenix that you've come out with, I got to shoot one the other night, and it was definitely impressive. It's, it was uh, James Gargan's got to go with me, and he's uh, he is ate up with it now. I mean, he loves that thing, and he's like, I can shoot fish ten foot deep with that. Thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's really nice. So I've I've been shooting mine. I actually cranked the draw weight down to about sixty pounds, mm -hmm. and like we were shooting some of those big buffs the other night, and I started off with big fish tips with my muzzies, and I wasn't getting the penetration, so I took those off, and still wasn't passing all the way through those big buffs. So, you know, it's really nice. I had the ability, if I needed to, to crank down another 10 pounds of draw weight. Um, and I actually set, we got to go shoot uh, some numbers the other night, me and Chuck and John. Mm -hmm. And typically I love to go after big fish, which is what a lot, you know, that you do a lot yep. too. Because yep. I know we both have the obsession to try to find the big ones. And, uh, but we shot in Florida. We were shooting tilapia, dink gar, and brennel. There were so many fish, and so we turned our ospreys down. I mean, I have one I've been playing around with. We're about to release some low deflection power limbs, mm -hmm. which will allow guys to keep the cable tension but get their bows down to, like, 25 pounds of draw weight, mm -hmm. you know, 20 pounds even. Yeah. And it was so much fun out there shooting. Um, I could see all that stuff would get addicting. Oh, yeah. And being able to turn it down like that, that's going to be an awesome addition for some of the younger kids. You know, like my son, he's going to be 10, 11. You know, I can get him in a bow and – Something he can shoot, you know, till he's forever, basically, you know. Yep, and that's a great thing. Life. Exactly. We came out with our new limb this year, so our our sizing now for Oneida is small, medium, and large. And the nice thing is our small size features our new limbs as well as the medium, but on the short side, we can get down to draw lengths like 24 and a half inches now 
with draw mm-hmm. stops. So the really cool thing is, like you said, for your son, for my girlfriend, people that want to go out there and shoot fish have a hard time pulling back that bow. They come shoot one of these. Man, they love it. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to get my son one. I mean, How old's your son now? He's nine. He'll be ten this year. So he's... So he's, he's right close. there. So it's the it is the Phoenix that can make all these changes now, or, the, or the, is the Osprey going to come out with some the, similar? The the Osprey is actually the same right now. So we still sell the positive draw control, which was the old style of draw stops, and uh, you can set those up on your Osprey. We sell them on our website, so you can get the Osprey down that short as well if you add those draw stops. Okay. To it. All right. But the draw stops come standard on the Phoenix, and uh, they're really nice. You can get a rock solid back wall and really kind of customize the feel of your bow. So. With the Phoenix, and this was going to be one of my questions going in, so obviously the Osprey's been the dominant premier bow for all these years in bow fishing. With the Phoenix, like what, what, was, your, what was Oneida's plan or hope for the Phoenix to do in bow fishing, but I'm, I'm assuming beyond? Yeah, so the main thing is, you know, I, I bought Oneida or, or was really interested and excited about it because of the bow fishing side. Right. But I also love to bow hunt, and so the more time that I spent around our lever bows, you know, love shooting them they're super smooth draw uh, really great shooting bows and so the goal was uh, with the kestrel going away we're going to bring in the phoenix we want something that the guy that wants to shoot target archery the guy that wants to to big game hunt or the guy that wants to bow fish now has a bow he can do it all with and uh, the other day when we were down in florida i was actually doing some hog hunting as well as shooting some offshore fish we had a really cool uh opportunity to go off Fort Myers and shoot amberjacks with our bows and so what I did on that trip was I actually took two strings with me and I took uh, um, some limb blocks I don't know if you have a set of these limb blocks yet but they're really handy for working on your Oneida or a lever bow out of the water so the great thing was I could literally put my bow fishing string on there with the finger slicks mm-hmm. shoot fish that day and the yeah. next morning we were going hog hunting threw in the limb blocks took that string off put my hunting string on and I was ready to go so the limb blocks are, you basically draw the bow, slide the limb blo- blocks in. So you put it down on the ground, you okay. step on the string, you lift the riser up, you put both blocks in place, then you let down the pressure, you can take the string off, do whatever changes you need to, and then you just point the bow down, you draw back, and the limb blocks fall right out, mm. you're good to go. It's really simple. Do you guys, are you guys selling those now? Or? We're not yet, but we're uh, considering bringing them in because they're just such a good tool. Um, to use there's a couple guys you can find on lever lovers or whatever on facebook that sell yeah. i think william truscott's his name he's actually sent me several sets of them and they're they're inexpensive and they're a great tool to have you know that's one of the biggest selling features of our bows at least in my mind for bow fishermen is that you know you're going to dry fire bows it just happens i've yep. broken knocks we shoot uh, nocturnals for our bow fishing tv show the habit a lot and mm-hmm. over the course of a night you kind of lose the grip on the string with those lighted knocks, and so occasionally you dry fire your bow. I can take my bow on the floor of the boat, and in 10 minutes, take it completely apart and rebuild it with nothing but an Allen wrench. If you go dry fire your compound, you're Wait. borrowing somebody else's bow, or you're yes. watching for the this rest is, of the night. So last year, we were shooting the, uh, the Missouri State shoot, the day shoot, and uh, we were actually in the bottom of the boat, had a situation where a guy dry fired a bow. And we were, I'm like sitting in the bottom of the boat, and you came rolling by in the Oneida boat. We were like, hey, Come on over. We need some technical support. But it was funny because about two months before that, we were at the carp out, and uh, Scott Hensley gave me the uh, gave me a cell phone number by mis- you know it was a mistake on his part because you know it's ten o'clock at night on Pickwick and my brother blows up his bow and uh, so I call Scott and I'm like, hey man, I'm in a world of hurt right here trying to put this back together. And he walked me through it and we put that thing back. In. Never, I've never worked on a bow like ever. And uh, in 10 minutes, I had the thing back together and with just an Allen wrench. Yeah. And uh, it just, you know, it, if I wasn't sold already, I would have been from that point on. So it, I was impressed, and so, it was a lot of fun. So with talking about how easy these bows are to work on, I know I'd seen you post on Facebook, and you've got some videos coming out uh, that you guys are putting together to talk about, you know, how to do all these, you know, not necessarily modifications, but maintenance and repairs on the Oneidas. Yep. So, yeah, a few different things. So that's one thing I found with our bows is that once you kind of get educated or once somebody walks you through, the main thing is you get to do it yourself with your own hands. But once you've worked on them and done it once or twice, they are super simple to work on. They're a little bit intimidating at first just because they're different than a compound. Um, We have a set of videos coming out both on the Osprey and on the Phoenix 
with how to perform, you know, all the different tasks you might need, some just general bow maintenance, some, you know, general do's and don'ts, but the main thing is how to change your timing, how to change cables, uh, if you're uh, having some issues, we have troubleshooting on there for brace height or, um, you know, just any common issue that you might have with an Oneida. Another cool opportunity uh, we've got coming up is that for anybody that's going to be in Springfield for the U.S. Open, uh, there's a couple of cool events I'm getting ready to release. Uh, one of them I've already kind of put out there is we're going to have an Oneida owner's party on Friday afternoon. And uh, it's going to be from like 11 to 2.30. And basically what we want is guys that own Oneidas, uh, you know, hey, if you've got two, give your buddy one so he can get in the door too. <laughs> but come over here to the factory. It's in Springfield. We're going to have a fish fry going on. We're going to have a shooting range so guys can shoot the new Phoenix. They can shoot the new Ospreys. I'm also going to have the guys out in the plant going through doing lessons so that if guys want to go back there and have specific questions, want to find out more about how either they can rebuild their bow if they have a problem or how to get their bow tuned perfectly. So I think it'll be really informative for guys that aren't as comfortable working on them. Uh, and for those that are already comfortable and, you know, used Oneida for a long time, it's a great opportunity to come catch up with everybody and, you know, have some fresh fish for sure. So do the, and this is just a question for me. Say a bow's in tune, your Oneida is in tune, rocking and rolling, and you shoot it for a full season. Is there similar to a compound where you get stretch or you get you can somewhat get out of tune, or is it kind of once it's in tune, it's rest keeps going? Typically, once you've got it in tune, it's going to keep going. Um, just like any bow, I feel like within the first couple hundred shots, you can get, experience a little bit of stretch, and so it's good to just you know double check. And uh, I did a small tip uh, earlier this year on it. One thing I love to do when I go out shooting, you actually asked me uh, the other day, you got your bow back, mm -hmm. had some things kind of fixed up on it, and you said, hey, it's Terry, knock high on paper. <clears throat> well, I don't really shoot my bow fishing bows through paper often. I feel like it's not the, maybe the best um, sign for how your bow's shooting when you're actually going to shoot it in the water, mm -hmm. and then you've got a reel tied on. And so what I like to do is just wait till I get to the lake mm -hmm. and I shoot in the water and I use the water just like I would want a paper tune. You want as small of a splash as possible. So if you shoot and you get a big old splash, you need to make some changes. If it's left to right, it's a rest adjustment. If it's up and down, it could be the stiffness of your arrow or it could be, you know, you need to move your knock set. But typically I go check my timing, shoot the bow in the water a few times. If it's shooting good, I just don't touch it. Yeah, I noticed that when... We were on Stockton one night, me and JP and a buddy of mine, and it wasn't quite dark yet. And he's just off the back of the boat, just shooting like crazy. I'm like, what, what the heck are you doing back there? <laughs> and he'd adjust a little bit and shoot and adjust and shoot. And finally he said, you know, I'm trying to get my bow in time, you know, make sure everything is good. And that was, I had no idea what you were doing back there other than moving stuff around. But Well, you can make a lot of different adjustments. You know, it was really interesting for me to, the second year, actually it was the second year some guys from Georgia won my tournament, Campbell, Hood, and Ellenberg. Mm -hmm. And these guys have been number shooters. They've won a bunch of tournaments down south, Georgia State tournaments and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, really good shooters. And so the third year of my tournament, they came back after they won the previous year, and I had them do a seminar uh, on tuning their boats because they're big Oneida shooters. And it was really interesting to hear because they were actually – adjusting their bows based on the depth of fish they were shooting that night. They were big on instinctive shooting, so they wanted their arrow to hit no matter, you know, they wanted to hit what they were looking at, no matter whether they're shooting fish at five feet or whether they're shooting rolling gar on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so it was unique to see the way that they would change their timing, so they had one place they'd always look, and they would actually adjust their bow to be able to hit exactly what they were looking at. So technically they wouldn't be aiming low. Their bow exactly. would be shooting where it needed, where they wow. Yeah, and so I thought that was really unique. Now, I don't know that I'm quite that good, but <laughs> I get mine in time, get a small splash, and I'm ready to go shoot fish. Yeah, those those are the guys that won it with a pile of big gar, wasn't it? Had yeah. A couple think, kicker grassies in there. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that was that was a fun tournament, being out there at the where the shooting academy is. I mean, yep. Being, looking off that hill and seeing all those boats, it was just like, Oh my gosh, it's hit the big time. You know? <laughs> it, was, it was a really cool place to do it. And this year, so we got three bow fishing tournaments. So mm -hmm. taking a step up from the normal U.S. Open. Last year I did a Missouri shoot, kind of a hybrid daytime, uh, first half of the night shoot. But mm -hmm. uh, this year we got the Muzzy Classic. It's a tournament. This will be its 18th year. So you guys are very familiar with the Muzzy. 
yep. changes is it's going to Nashville. Uh, be a Big 20 tournament like normal. It's April 29th. Um, and anywhere on the Cumberland or the Kentucky River systems. Tennessee. Tennessee. Sorry, yeah. Tennessee. Thank you, Kentucky Lake over here. <laughs> but uh, anywhere on the Cumberland or the Tennessee Rivers. Um, pretty excited to see the turnout there. It's always around the time of the spawn. Water levels are starting to come up everywhere. Chuck was just shooting some rolling uh, commons yesterday, I starting to pre-spawn. Yeah. So uh, he's all giddy, and I think a lot of guys down in the <laughs> south are. So uh, really excited about it. Then we got the U.S. Open yep. back here in Missouri this year, and uh, we still have some spots available to sign up for the U.S. Open. So, um, you know, definitely come come compete here. It's a lot of fun. we got five lakes open for competition. Um, guys really like that the lakes are laid out for them here. There's really no secrets. You yeah. just got to get out and scout the water and find yep. your fish. Yep. You know, I think Table Rock is going to be a hidden gem this year. I think with having the year off and not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, well, it, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe it, it really could be. And so here's what I think has happened too. Oh, I kind of agree with you because over the years, guys have shot it. It's clear water. It's hard to hit fish. Uh, it's not the normal big shallow lakes guys are used mm -hmm. to shooting. But I definitely know with airboats being open this year on Truman, uh, which they were last time we were here, and new this year is they're going to be on Bull Schultz. And so uh, there'll be more pressure there, no doubt, because it's going to split up the guys with fan and airboats that want to be able to run their boats. So right. mm -hmm. um, I feel like Table Rock could definitely be a good option. Uh, there's still some really big average fish in there, yeah. but it can be slim pickings at times. Yes, at times. it can be. I'm, I've been already thinking about it, and... There's a couple lakes I think you could win it on. I mean, I, I'm, the lakes I'm thinking of, there's, I think there's three lakes you could easily win it off of, depending on what the lakes are like and what the what the mm -hmm. fish are doing. But well, and the key has always been with tournaments. So I'm doing a, I'm pretty excited about this uh, bow fishing series I'm doing online this year. It's called Night Shift, and so we're gonna be BassPro.com forward slash Night Shift. We're gonna launch it right around the Muzzy tournament. Uh, but it'll be a lot of bow fishing, just action from around different places that uh, I got to go this spring and this summer. So you get to see some, some bow fishing action. But also, I try to cover a lot of gear tips, uh, also fishing tips. So we're talking about water temperature, like what I look for when I find fish. Because a lot of people, you know, see pictures I post and stuff. And like, you know, over the years, especially around here on our lakes, you learn, you know, what water levels to look for, what temperatures, and when those combine. I've got a pretty good idea in the back of my mind. Here's where I need to go to find fish because, mm -hmm. you know, right now our lake's still over five feet low. Yep. It's coming up, which I'm excited about. I know, that and the water temperature. Yeah, yeah definitely. Good. But, you know, you just got to know what spots to be at the right time. Um, I told the story on the previous, one of the other episodes of <laughs> when uh, you took us to that one spot and you were like, we're going to kill a big fish in here. And it was like five minutes later, we stuck like a 40-pound grassy. That was... <laughs> that was awesome. I was that like, was just that was, that was, like, that was just lucky. Amazing. But but no, that's definitely the thing. You know, and around here my on my local lakes, I've been bow fishing here since I'm seventeen. I got my own boat, so I've explored over the years a lot of spots. And when it comes to these tournaments, you know, this is one thing I'm gonna cover on my web show and that a lot of people they go out there and I've actually seen some guys on Facebook lately, hey, we're scouting for the muzzy, and every night they're killing a bunch of awesome fish, which is great. And we're so far from the muzzy, they may not be there when they get back. So I'm not knocking them for shooting fish. But right. people say, oh, I'm going scouting. Well, what does scouting really mean? And I think what you find is from the guys that day in, day out, year in, year out, compete in these tournaments. You know, it's Tommy Woods and, uh, you know, Yader is always a factor. And, mm -hmm. and no matter who it is, you look and it's like, okay, what do these guys do before anything else? They cover a ton of water. Yes. If you're scouting with your trolling motor, you are wasting your time. I'm just here to tell you that. So you need to be on the outboard. Obviously, you need to stay safe where your life jackets, your kill switch, but you need to be on your outboard, your kicker, your airboat. That's why airboats have the advantage. It's not shooting fish in the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, it's scouting because they cover so much water. Yeah, I deer hunted with Tommy in Kansas, and he was telling me, I forgot, it was some ungodly amount of miles of bank that they can cover in one night scouting. I mean, he and they unreal. basically just stand up there and like, yeah, there we ran this whole lake in one night. It's not worth coming back to. Yep. Or there's these I heard guys that just run a clicker, and it's like they're clicking fish. Well, and it depends on what you're doing. I mean, I've I've done it before, and like uh, August and I shot south into Kentucky Lake when you're in Chuck's airboat, and we were wanting to go fun shoot. But there's a tournament, so like you know what, we'll just enter just the two of us and go shoot in it. We went around the night before in Chuck's airboat. We were able to cover so much water. 
I put a GPS up on the front steering stick, and every time we pass a fish over, you know, 25 or 30 pounds, I was marking it. And so these guys also get a plan. So they go cruise, they mark all these fish, and they go back and they say, okay, one, how many boats are there? How many guys are we going to have to compete against? They get a plan. These are A holes. These are the B holes. These are the C holes. These are the places we're going to hit all night. They there's got a plenty plan. of A holes. Yeah, there's a lot of A holes out there. You're figuring <laughs> that out too. But you know, that's one cool thing about boat fishing. I feel like you run into a lot of really great people. I've met way more quality stand up oh, people through boat fishing than I have for sure the dickheads. But no doubt, there's some of those there too. <laughs> there is. I've, there's always I've a boat C. Is it yeah. was it boat C? Yeah. That was the yeah. bad one, yeah, right? Exactly. Right. I think of all the times I've been out, I've only ran across one boat that I went up and talked to the guys, and they wouldn't even talk to you. It was before a tournament scouting. I was like, "You boys see anything?" I mean, I'll, tell me. At least, no, I at really least lie care, to me. You know? At yeah. least lie. Come yeah. on now. <laughs> and they just like turned and drove off. I'm like, "What in the world?" <laughs> you don't belong here. Yeah. I was on Stockton one night, and we were in the pontoon boat, me and a couple of buddies. We shot a lot of fish. We had a good night. One, one real big, big mouth buffalo. And, uh, anyway, we saw some other boat fishing lights. The other end of our cove, they kind of came in while we were back in the back. So we went cruising over there to just kind of see who it was and say, hey. And We're in the pontoon boat, so it looks like a UFO coming over there. But mm-hmm. at first, they were kind of like, you know, who's that? Why are you guys coming over here? And then they saw it was me. You recognize the boat. So, oh, my God, we can't believe they just pulled up and started chatting with us <laughs> on the lake. So it was pretty fun. You know, it's a good brotherhood of people. Oh, uh, it's, it's probably, as far as competitive sports, I mean, it's. There's a lot of secrets, but most people are happy to tell you, you know, anything you want to know. Yeah. Other than where the big fish are. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean. And the funny thing natural. is, you know, how many of these guys, too, want to say, oh, yeah, it's a secret, you know, where the fish are. But, you know, the funny thing is we go to a couple handful of lakes around here, and a lot of times Chase and I will look up, and we'll be right next to each other in the same cove. Yeah. So while we think they're secret, sometimes they're not as much as yeah. we think they are. The secret spots are another spot, another guy's spot he goes to every night. You the know. difference is getting them in the boat when you see them. Yes. Yeah. And that's what exactly. separates, I think, the average guys and the guys that really do it well. That's, what, that's what's kind of the allure, too. It's like, oh, I've got this spot. You know, it just adds to the adds to the fun. So the first the first open we fish was number two, and uh, we'd scouted the spot for the three or four nights prior to the, the tournament, and we didn't see a boat. We were just like, okay, here we go. This is gonna be getting saw just caught just stacked everywhere. It's feeling great. Roll up that night. There's like nine boats go blind blowing by as we put the boat in the water. It's like, yeah. It always makes you feel good when, you know, you've got some big fish mark or something and you're one of the first ones out of takeoff and you get there and there's already another boat there. Like, oh, it just makes you so mad. But, but I drove so fast. Yeah. So I had heard that the guys that won the Open two years ago on Table Rock and or, or here mm-hmm. was either where you were in that cove. No. Or they were uh, on another end of the lake. But that's what I was told by a guy that saw them there. Well, was it the year? No, it wasn't. No, the year that uh, number two years ago was the two guys from Central Missouri. The guys from yeah. Central Missouri with all the yeah. with all yeah, the grasses. Yeah, they're from Clinton actually. Clinton, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've known him for a while. He's got a dual mud motor boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They shot. It was pretty cool. He said the first fish they shot that afternoon. They got there a little bit before daylight. First fish they shot was the big fish for the tournament. It was like sixty four pound grassy or something. So. Wasn't it? I heard that it was, it was the Scroggins. Year Scroggins was telling me that. that right. They watched. They were watching the same fish they were, but they got there first. Hmm. And they said they were there every night. Yeah. Crazy. I found a spot like that last year for a tournament that we had held during the daytime. I found them at night, but we found a spot, man, on Table Rock. And that's a cool thing to know they're still out there. But, man, we found a spot that was loaded with grass carp. And it was so exciting. Now, they weren't nearly as many back there Saturday night. We went back. But Thursday night, man, we were, you know, that makes you so excited to blast off and get out there to the water at dark. Was that the same spot we were both going to to start the night, the day off, or was that? No, in no. fact, in fact, I think we thought we were racing to the same spot, and I was going somewhere different than you were, <laughs> but we still had a good truck race. Yeah, yeah. He took off, it was a little ways behind me, and we're going down 65, and I see his silver truck just screaming behind me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, crap, he's going to catch me. <laughs> That was half yeah, the fun. Three weeks started started you bought a diesel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm right, about needing that. to do that myself. So you went from, I guess, a troller boat, your very first boat, and then you, did you build your fan second? Yep. So I had a trolling motor boat for a lot of years, and then when I was in college, uh, I had the guys build me the, the fan boat. And it's an awesome boat. It's got one heck of a light set up on it. 
the fan. And then last year, uh, actually, uh, three years ago, I got my pontoon boat. It's got a kicker, but that thing's kind of like driving a barge. Um, <laughs> I remember when you showed up, had it parked at the open, you know, you first unveiled it. It was just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's the most amazing. fun boat fishing boat you've ever had. Is that had. a putting green on it, there? It actually fishes really well. I've kind of gotten in a hybrid where I use the kicker, and I also keep the trolling motor down, specifically like a table rock where it's pretty clear water to help steer. Mm -hmm. But it's a great rig for piling up fish or big heads. Oh, it's perfect. Oh, that'd be, yeah. For sitting down there on below the dam just watching for big heads, that'd be. Yeah, yeah it's great fun. Plenty of shade. Crank the music up and <laughs> be a good time. For, for sure. So then you built your, your new kicker rig, which I guess was last year? Yeah. Yep. Got it built right before my Missouri tournament last year. And, uh, basically took our standard 20-foot grizzly bow fishing boat and uh, made a few modifications. A um, little less storage, just to open the deck floor plan up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, did a 15-horse kicker on it with a stick steer up on the front bow. And man, I am in love with kicker boats. It is awesome, especially for our lakes oh, around yeah. here in Missouri. Uh, you know, we don't have a whole lot of super shallow stuff. We don't have a ton of vegetation. Uh, so you can cover a ton of water. They turn great. You can chase fish down. Really a lot of fun. Oh, when I, when I got mine, I think it completely changes the way you fish. I mean, I could I could cover in an hour the water I'd cover in four hours with my, you know, 36-volt troller on mm -hmm. full power. I fished Table Rock the other night in my fan boat. This is a month ago, and I didn't want to be running the fan because it's loud. And I don't like, you know, making people angry at us. So I was trolling. I had to go back and put the outboard in the water and put it in gear because we were going so slow. I could barely stand it with a trolling motor. And it's tough because we do a lot of filming between the night shift and the habit. And I get to drive and it's really hard to slow down because those LEDs, while I can see great to kill fish for the camera, they have to be right in the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. My problem is I fall in love with going too fast <laughs> and uh, it makes it hard to get good video of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's... So how, how about how fast will that 15 horse push the 20? Tracker. You know, I think more important than how fast it's pushing it is like your acceleration, your whole shot. Sure, because sure. what I found a lot, the biggest advantage of the kicker is on buffalo, without a doubt. And, you know, when you blow them out, I can chase them. Okay. Now, now you have a four-blade uh, prop on your kicker, yeah. and I have a three-blade, but I want to do some more experimenting. Uh, I get plenty of top-end speed. I don't know. It's probably eight miles an hour or something like that I get with my kicker, but the big thing is being able to take off when one blows out and, mm -hmm. and have a chance at catching them. I got now, you. with your biggest fish, sometimes you just can't catch them unless you're in an air oh, boat. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know if, I mean, that eight miles an hour, like you said, I think that's about what mine will run. And it's, I think that's about as fast as you can run before it starts trying to get up on pad, you know, and uh, starts pushing a bunch of water. But Even mine, when I get loaded with fish and we got three or four guys on the deck and you get to run and you still notice it start pushing a wall of water. But half the time, I think that wall of water is pushing those buffalo to the surface. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's a big thing with airboats. When you get three or four guys up on the bow, you push a lot of water. You don't necessarily notice it until you get in a foot of water, and then you notice you're pushing this huge right. wake, and you got two foot of water in front of the boat, and you got six inches behind the boat in water. Yeah. Because you're pushing it all. And so. And then fish just roll up into that two foot, I exactly. guess. Exactly. It's just like, I feel like with buffalo, the harder you chase them, the closer to the surface they come. And I think part of it's them swimming really hard. And then that wave catching their tail, and I think it just they just ride up in the water column. That's what uh, with those big busts I was killing this winter. I think I took Pate, mm -hmm. took some other guys. The other guys I took could, hadn't figured it out. They uh, they go out there with the troller boats and and just couldn't couldn't figure out how to kill them. I mean, they'd go kill one. Yeah. And I took them out, and same deal. I mean, I did run that kicker wide open where we were at, and you'd be going along, and all of a sudden just. Right in front of the boat. I mean, it was four or five foot of water, but right. probably the same deal. I mean, just chase them and they get up to the top. And yeah, know, which is really, really fun. Oh, and true. that's where I'm excited about Tracker. So, uh, you know, we came up with this line of boats, I think, four years ago now. Actually, it's I think it's been five years ago uh, we came up with the first 18-foot Tracker boat. And, uh, you know, they were a pretty big hit. We sold a lot of boats. We came up with a 20-footer and a 16-footer. And... 20 footers become our most popular boat and so that kind of tipped me off as much as I love my kicker and as great as that boat's been for me um, I kind of pushed tracker and so we're working on coming out with a kicker rig 
Uh, really excited about it. You know, guys look at our tracker boats for a couple reasons. One, you know, all made here in America by some really skilled craftsmen. A lot of pride goes into those boats. They work really hard on them. But they also come with a warranty. Mm -hmm. And it's hard That's to big. find unless you get a custom boat built by somebody. You know, it's hard to find what you want in a boat. Uh, it's hard to find a boat that you can go weld some deck onto right. and keep your warranty. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's not. I mean, it's totally doable to go out and build your own boat. No question. But, I mean, you're going to make mistakes. And it's going to take two or three boats before you figure it out exactly. So, that, I mean, that can get expensive. So a normal guy, and, and the other appeal that I've always saw with the tracker bow fishing boats was the option to finance. Yeah, you know, that's just a that's a big mm. deal. Without a doubt. And the cool thing is, you know, we're going to come out with this new boat. I'm really excited. We're going to release uh, the new boat at the U.S. Open here in Springfield. So that'll be the first opportunity for everybody to get their hands on them, jump around, play inside the boat, check everything out. I've got one right now, and I'm telling you, it's like my favorite boat. I love it. And. Uh, so we're working really hard on it. We're just ironing out the last few little uh, issues with the steering system, making sure that's bulletproof for guys. Um, the cool thing is now for the guys that own a trolling motor boat, the guys that built their own boat, they're ready to take it to the next level, and they don't want to screw up steering three or four times. You know, they don't want to make the same mistakes we made. Uh, it's going to be a great fit for them. So not only do we have the kicker uh, on the boat, but we're also redoing the whole lighting setup on the boats. Mm -hmm. Uh, which will be great. We're going with more of a standard DC uh, generator. Um, I've heard those are pretty nice. With the DC power where you can, you basically run your light 12 volt off the well, generator. Well, so, yeah, and that's the way we've been doing it, sorry, is DC. And we're changing it to oh, AC okay, now. Okay, okay. Uh, to go with uh, kind of what most people do with their lights. Okay, okay. Gotcha. And uh, it'll be more friendly for the boat. Uh, we're going to include some extra brackets. I think they come standard with like eight lights. But for the guys that say, hey, I want to fill this thing wall to wall with lights like, mm -hmm. like I do and you probably do, uh, you know, we're going to sell the brackets in there too or just throw the brackets in with a boat so that guys can, you know, really exactly. beef it up to match what they want to do. So, so these boats, and I, I've read this online and we'll just clear the air right now, there's nothing special about your boat other than you've built it as kind of a prototype kicker boat. It's... It's the exact boat that other guys are going to get if they, you know, when you come out with this kicker boat, it's going to be very, very similar. So there's yeah. a few things that I've done with mine that just been little learning things that I'm actually going to do different, hope to make better on this new boat. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll have a different steering stick, a different steering system. But the more that I've got to play around with it, a little bit of testing, I like it better than the one I've got now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm pretty excited about those changes. But, you know, the boat... There's no secret to it. It's a solid boat. You guys put a ton of flotation in them. We have taller sides now than we've ever had in the past. That's what I really liked about it when you yeah. came out with that new style was the taller sides for sure. And we went through a hole change uh, about three years ago now, two and a half years ago, something like that. And uh, our boats now have a um, wider okay. angle on the nose uh, of the boat. And uh, the boat really doesn't have a wedge shape like it used to. Um, really perform the handling of the boat, the performance of it. They float really nice and level, whether you're loaded in the front or the back. So I've been pretty happy with it. So I posted online that we were, uh, or on Facebook, that we were going to be interviewing you tonight. And first person to respond was Tim Wells. He said, where's that 20 bucks you owe me? <laughs> do, do you have a response to that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. If it was from bow fishing, he'd be owing me 20 bucks. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember that 20, but Tim can come come on the boat and win it back. That's right. Let me see. I'm just jumping through a couple of the others. Tim Wells, he's, he's a pretty awesome guy. I don't know how many of you guys out there have had the opportunity to meet him. He's been at several of the U.S. Opens. He's going to be at the Muzzy this year. I think he's going to be at the U.S. Open. Uh, super nice guy. He's kind of a wild man, spearing animals and blowgun and stuff. But really excited. He's come over to the Oneida family. Uh, we started sponsoring a show this year really fits his style so he's an instinctive shooter no sight shoot with fingers and uh he got the bows in his hands late in the year and man he's been stacking stuff up he's been shooting ducks and geese i saw that duck at coos that. deer those videos are cool yeah so he's he's a wild man he's a lot of fun to be around and if you're going to be at the tournaments this year definitely talk to him you'll enjoy the minutes he gets to spend with him oh yeah my son he got to meet him in springfield two years ago and you know, him and Pigman both, I mean, took all the time in the world. I mean, he was collecting autographs from you and Belmore and 
and John and <laughs> me and, and Chuck and John devalued his hat for sure. <laughs> yeah, so, but no, he's a good guy for sure. Uh, another guy asked, "Have you ever taken your dad bow fishing?" Oh yeah. So actually, the very first night when I got my first bow fishing boat built. I kind of got it built without even asking my dad. I just kind of went to the guys at Tracker and we worked on building this boat. So I said, hey, I got a surprise. Come down to the marina and meet me. So after dinner, I drug him down there. We went out and got on the boat. And uh, he loves it because, one, he loves fishing. He loves the water. Uh, and so he loves getting out, driving the boat. He'll be on the trolling motor, guiding us around. And he's always trying to talk us out of shooting the small ones. He's always all about us trying to stick some monster fish. But uh, he's bow fished with me before with the gar guys down in Texas. He was with me when I killed uh, my biggest alligator gar was eight foot four, bottomed out a two hundred fifty pound scale we had. Is it that one? Not that no, one. Not that one was from Louisiana, but he was uh, he was with me on that trip, and uh, so he's been with me several times. He enjoys it, and uh, he's been a huge factor of me getting into Oneida, um, getting into the bow fishing tournaments. Uh, you know, I think he kind of said, "Hey, this is a passion of yours." Uh, he said it reminds him a lot of the early days of bass fishing. You know, he was at some of the first uh, Bassmaster Classics they held here at Table Rock and down in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And he came to my first boat fishing tournament at Table Rock and said, hey, you're really on to something here. He said, these guys are all into it. It's a growing sport. So he's been probably one of the biggest factors that's kind of pushed me to keep getting more and more into the sport. So he's he's really cool and really helped support me. So With, with the way boat fishing is growing, do you see – do you see more tournaments like yours having, or I guess not like yours, but having different qualifiers around the country for a, like a classic type, a Bassmaster classic type tournament at the end? Or do you think, I mean, it could be a long ways down the road, but. Oh, well, without a doubt, bow fishing tournaments are going to continue to evolve. You know, uh, a couple years ago, you know, you had big ones like the Muzzy that were kind of a mainstay and consistent every year, and they would get you know, 75, 80 boats to come participate. I think their biggest year was 87 boats. Um, my first year of the U.S. Open, uh, we got like 127 boats, uh, you know, teams of four. And then the next year we had 225, and then we've had 250. Last year we had about 220 boats. And so you've seen the popularity of the sport grow. Now you've started seeing new formats of tournaments come up, like the carp out, where it's an individual angler mm -hmm. fee, and they're shooting their own fish, which is really cool. Um I think that style of tournaments really benefits the average bow fisherman. Right. Everybody thinks right. they've got a chance to win. Mm -hmm. uh, and while maybe not as good of a chance as some, uh, you know, you can always stumble into that one big yep. fish. You can, get, you're, you can get lucky. You whether know? you're standing in a 14-foot John boat or a $75,000 air boat, you could win that thing. And so no doubt that's a big draw. I think we're going to look to offer new and exciting stuff in the future in our tournaments. I'd love to look at doing... Uh, an individual angler style tournament just like that around here with our mm -hmm. lakes. I think it'd be very popular. Uh, also, something I've never done in the past uh, are numbers tournaments. But one thing I'm considering doing next year, we got to go down to Florida, and they have a big problem with invasive species down there because of how warm the climate is. And so I think we have a cool opportunity next year to maybe do a tournament early in the year that would really target invasive species, partner up with the Florida Wildlife Commission. Pythons. Yeah. yeah, you shoot pythons too. When we were down there the other night, we were joking around it about, was. I got dibs on the first python that comes swimming in front of the boat. Wouldn't that be cool? We be were, awesome. I was in the Caymans two years ago, and there were iguanas everywhere, and they were, the, the locals were just, just hated them. And uh, it was one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, this would be so much fun. <laughs> they're there's a, there's, swimming in the canals. There's a guy that owns an Oneida. He's a guy down around Miami, and if you get a hunting license there, you can actually shoot iguanas. They're invasive, you know, they're all over. So I've seen pictures of him in his bow fishing boat at night with the lights on, holding up big old iguanas he stuck with his bow. That's awesome. Future trip right there. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, me and Pate have talked about this, um, just not necessarily on the show, but that bow fishing is going to be sustainable for, I mean, I think in the next 10 years it will be, but in the next 20 or 30, what's, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I think there's a few great things boat fishing's got going for it. Uh, right now, there's a huge population of rough fish. Um, so anglers or fishermen, whatever you want to call them, are having a lot of success. They're having a lot of fun. Guys are getting to fling a lot of arrows. Um, you know, long term, when you look at a lot of our lakes and river systems, 
Uh, it's about managing for native species. That's a big thing you hear a lot, no matter which state you go to. Mm -hmm. The majority of the fish that we target are non-native species, common carp, grass carp. Now, you do have some species like buffalo and gar that are native to where you know we shoot and live. And so in Missouri, we're unique that we already have a limit. It's one of the few states that have a limit on rough mm -hmm. fish. So we have a 20 per day aggregate limit on buffalo and gar. And I think as bow fishermen, it's important to police ourselves. You know, you got some guys that go out and they shoot 25 fish and it's the best night of boat fishing they've ever had. And then you've got other guys that they post pictures and literally they had to go offload the airboat six times and they shot 1,400 fish last night. And, you know, it's kind of like unfair to the small guys. Say, Man, they're going out shooting that many. So I think what you'll see is over the years, I don't see a limit on invasive species like common carp. Mm. Or uh, silvers. Or like heads, silvers yeah. or big heads. But it would not surprise me in the future, for bow fishermen themselves to want to stand up and say, you know what, I want to start regulating the harvest so that we have fish around for years to come. Um, also, with bow fishing, they got to be so close to the surface of the water for us to take them. It's typically pretty hard to have a huge, huge impact um, on some of these fish species just because we're limited in the amount of water that we can mm -hmm. shoot them in. Right. Um, you know, conditions have to line up right. We can go one night and fill the boat. And you can go a couple nights later and be bragging about how good it's going to be. And you take some people and you don't hardly fire a shot. Yeah, for sure. So that's one thing that's always amazed me with bow fishing that, you know, it's really hard to tell exactly what it is. I can't put my thumb on pressure or moon phase or temperature, any one thing. But it's amazing to me that within about half an hour of the time you leave the boat ramp, you know whether it's going to be a good night or whether it's going to be a slow, you know, boring yeah. night out there on the water. Oh, yeah. Well... I guess we've covered a ton of stuff. We definitely have. Yeah. One thing, too, pretty exciting about cover this year-end Ultimate Bow Fishing Championship. Yes, just that was, a little that was bit my get last out question. Because I'm pretty excited about it. And you ask about tournaments and kind of qualifiers and all this stuff. And that was one of my thoughts. You know, the World Championships have been around for a long time. This year it's in Louisiana, and it's uh, pretty much an airboat tournament because down there it's really hard to compete in the shallow water and the amount of grass they have if you don't have an airboat. Mm -hmm. Um so the cool thing about the Ultimate Bow Fishing Championships is it's really going to bring in archers from around the country. We've got several different ways that you can qualify. If you finish in the top 20 in the Muzzy, top 20 in the U.S. Open, top 20 in the AMS. There's also uh, some qualifiers coming from the Cajun 8, some from the World Championships. And any team that competes in the Muzzy and the U.S. Open also gets to come to Ultimate Bow Fishing Championships. So I'm really excited. I'm going to be sending each team, each team uh, personalized letters, inviting them to come participate. It's a two-night deal. So the teams that win, the Muzzy, the U.S. Open, the AMS Big, Tw uh, Big 30, the Cajun 8, uh, and also the team that shoots the biggest fish through those four tournaments, those five teams are guaranteed to get through to the last night of competition. Which is Saturday, right? Which is Saturday yeah. night. It's going to be on Bull Shoals. Uh, we're going to launch everybody out of Lead Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody will be in on the water takeoff. Those five teams get to go first, and then we'll stagger blast off after that. The other 20 teams that make it into the final night, we get selected from Friday night, so we'll take the top 20 finishers. Those guys can do Table Rock. They can do Truman. They can do Stockton. They can do Palm de Terre. Any of those four lakes. And so... Uh, we're going to do the weigh-in for the first night of Bass Pro. The second afternoon, Saturday afternoon, we're going to have a get-together event at the Shooting Academy, mm -hmm. which is where we held our second U.S. Open. Uh, it's a great venue. We're going to have some really cool stuff. We're going to have a cookout, just kind of a social for the guys that didn't make it to the last night if they want to come hang out. You know, I assume a lot of them already have hotel room for the night off. Mm -hmm. So give them an opportunity to come see the top 25 teams roll out on their way to Bull Shoals. So I feel like that'll be really cool. We're going to be way in there. Um, it should be pretty neat. No, I'm, I'm excited about that. I mean, I, I just need you to move the date one weekend, one weekend either way. Yeah, you got a just, wedding. Yes, yes, I got a wedding. Uh, so, what not, time is your wedding over? I, I don't know. It's my sister's wedding. I, <laughs> uh, Anybody else, you could probably, you know. Yeah, I could blow it off. I'm a groomsman, so. That, that uh, one's going to be tough. To I told them I need a out. cardboard cutout, and they can just <laughs> set me up there. We can figure something out, I'm sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Hey, one other cool thing, too, is for teams that come to the U.S. Open this year, we got two things going on on Friday uh, for the U.S. Open weekend. The first one I talked about earlier, we're doing our Oneida owner's party here at Oneida headquarters. 
but also for any team that comes to the store and registers on site on Friday, we're going to give you, your family, whoever's traveling with you, passes to go through our new museum and aquarium. Awesome. It's not even open yet, so it'll be a sneak peek just for competitors and their families or friends that are in town for the event. And, man, it's really cool. There's some giant fish in there. We've got some big alligator gar. Uh, we got some giant crappie. No ospreys allowed. No ospreys allowed in there. <laughs> We're going to have somebody frisking you boys at the door. <laughs> That's right. I've seen some pictures that you've posted or Snapchat or something, and it looks phenomenal. It's really, really cool. And so that's uh, another positive. Uh, like I said, just Friday night uh, from, I think it's from 2 to 7. So uh, it gives guys an opportunity or their families to really go in there and spend a few hours kind of having family time, let the kids yeah. have fun. Get and the time with the wife and kids in. There's a the... big Brazilian, like, Amazon River exhibit, too. And there's some big arapaima and these big pacu. They look like giant buffalo. It gets Chuck and I's fever up every time. I sent him a video from it the <laughs> other night because we got to shoot in the Amazon one time. And So when are those are those arapaima, are those the fish? I think I saw them on uh, one of those shows on the History Channel or something where they, I mean, they come out of the water like a torpedo yeah they can launch uh, like twice their body length out of the water and they actually eat a lot of birds like off branches and limbs and all of course kinds they of stuff. do yeah yeah so I pretty cool them. stuff so <laughs> anyway uh it's been enjoyable hanging out with you guys today and talking bow fishing and bows and uh good stuff hope everybody comes by oneida and says hello if i don't see you here i'll see you at the bow fishing tournaments and uh it's gonna be a great year whether you're a you know, serious bow fisherman looking to take your game to the next level or just getting started, uh, it's a heck of a lot of fun. I urge everybody to get into it because I can't put it down. Oh, paid up with it. Mm -hmm. I want to go tonight even though it's raining. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I'd, be, I'd yeah. be going to the muzzy, but i uh, got a baby due like three days before. so. <laughs> yeah. Missing, shut, miss, well, hope, it, hope it comes a week down. early and then maybe you can make yeah, it with us. I know. Yeah, missing Dennis and missing the muzzy. I know. Just slacking. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys... Appreciate you coming on, JP, and we'll uh, talk at you later. All right. Sounds good. See you, you guys. Later, boys. Thanks. See you.